<laughs> Yo, welcome back. We're here again, week two of Train Boston Physical Therapy Roundtable Discussion. Um, shout out to everyone who watched our first video. I think last time I checked, it was like 30 views on YouTube. So I figure like most of our parents watched it a couple of times and then maybe we got a couple randoms in there. So shout out to all of our uh, uh, mom, and, mom and dad. Um, moving on today from ACL rehab, we're gonna take a look at low back pain and PT rehab again, just because this is something that we treat so often um, in the clinic and in athletic populations as well as non-athletic populations. So we figured the extended Train Boston family could potentially get some benefit out of us just sharing our insights as to management and then kind of getting back to training what that looks like. So um, low back pain can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It's a really broad term. So probably a good place to start is coming to consensus as how we define low back pain and what are some different types that we typically, uh, typically, excuse me, treat in the clinic. So I wanted to pass it off to Dave, our fearless leader. Um, when you hear low back pain, if you were to try and classify that into subgroups, what exactly would that look like? Well, and I mean, that's a, it's a pretty broad question. I think you can go a lot of directions uh, kind of with that. So if you're talking about, you know, people that kind of get defined as like a non-specific low back pain, you know, I don't, I don't really like that term, you know, you know, too, too much, but, you know, I think you fall into people that have more muscular based, um, you know, pathology, whether that's, you know, re recurrent strains, uh, you know, or little micro traumas uh, versus things that have more of a disc pathology or more of a joint related degenerative quality. And I think it's pretty much what I see the three, <clears throat> excuse me, the three most of, you know, while we're at work. Um, I think a lot of people kind of come in and they think it's, maybe something different or just a little strain. But, you know, when people have more of a chronic issue, you know, strains will, aren't gonna typically last, you know, six months to a couple of years where, um, you know, some of these other issues are going to kind of persist and kind of get better, kind of get worse. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to think just to, you know, really kind of classify and generalize, but I think, you know, if you're off the top of my head, you know, you, you got your normal muscle strain, then you have your, your disc pathologies, your joint related pathology, um, and then, you know, from those, I think you have some other, you know, subsets that you could always, you know, really kind of branch off if you really wanted to get really, really specific with certain things that along with, you know, how certain uh, injuries really kind of behave. So a lot of times what I'll end up doing is, you know, if we're going to classify it, I'll classify it into, you know, kind of how an injury is behaving other than just, you know, an anatomical, you know, classification. So whether that's someone that, you know, has, you know, tons of back pain, you know, at rest, and by rest, I mean, you know, sitting or sleeping, you know, versus someone that's more of an active individual that is having recurring back pain with uh, something athletic in nature. Um, so I think once you kind of, you know, kind of figure out a little bit how their problem is really behaving, then you can classify a little bit better. And then you can really start a little bit more of a thorough assessment evaluation on how they're moving and what you really need to kind of work on to clean things up from there. I, I think that was perfect. Um, and I think we can all agree when patients present in the clinic, oftentimes there's a ton of overlap between those. Um, it, it's really never typically just one thing, whether it's strictly the joint or, or strictly, you know, a soft tissue muscle issue. Um, likely there's a couple things going on there, um, along with some other factors to consider um, with their musculoskeletal system. So obviously it's a big gray area, but um, I think you just did an awesome job of trying to break it down just a little bit, just because it, it's just so broad and can mean so many different things. So uh, moving on from there, from a pure assessment standpoint, let's just say uh, with acute low back pain, someone's on your schedule um, for next week, what are some things in your head from an evaluation standpoint that you know you really need to um, investigate and examine uh, before choosing what direction you go with your specific treatment intervention. Let's, uh, Kev, what do you got for us? I would say, I mean, whether you're dealing with acute low back pain or chronic, I don't know if your evaluation is gonna vary too much. Um, with acute, you're probably gonna try to go and, and reduce some of their symptoms off the bat because it's a little bit easier to 
get some symptom management if the low back pain is acute versus if it's chronic. But I think basically we're looking at, uh, you know, movement patterns and trying to find the underlying reason as to why the back pain is there in the first place. Other than if there was a blunt force trauma or a specific injury, a fall, car accident, something like that, um, you know, it really becomes an investigation as to why the shear force is collecting in the lower back. So I think all our evaluations are going to come from a whole head to toe perspective and uh, identify what movement patterns are dysfunctional and kind of break it down to its smaller parts and pieces. But, um, you know, I think the lower back is, is very in oftentimes the, the, the guilty culprit as to why they have lower back pain. I think Kev just hit that. I think with regards to low back pain, truly our assessment comes from the subjective. It starts when the patient literally walks into the clinic and your first uh, assessment of them is them walking to the office and seeing how they're moving. Um, from there, we're doing a, like a full functional assessment, you know, a toe touch, um, a back extension, spinal twist, if they can handle it, depending on how bad they're um, low back pain is, but it, I think it truly, with regards to low back pain, it comes from what are you doing and how have you been moving throughout your daily life and truly understanding how your movement patterns, um, what, what chronic movement patterns you do can really affect low back pain. Yeah, I, mean, I think Michelle, you said, had some really nice points there as a Kev. You know, and I think other than, you know, getting through the, uh, you know, really solid, you know, assessment as to how people are moving and what their, their functional ability patterns are, and picking up on all those differences that we see and trying to relate that to how, you know, some sort of pathology or pain really starts. You know, other than, than that, I think, you know, day one, it's also pretty important to try to get someone, as you said, to kind of understand what are they doing in their daily lives to make this thing worse? And why are they continuing in this irritable, you know, phase? and why is this, this cycle happening every couple of days or every day, however you know frequent that that's happening for them? I think there's there's usually got to be a, a pretty good you know stress on some patient education in the beginning also, and just teach them how their particular back issue is behaving during their day, and then how to, how can we help them to change that so that they're not constantly just getting themselves into a bad place and really you know keeping this this cycle going and going and going. Um, as you guys know, you know if they can't understand why they're hurting themselves um, even just from basic activity world it, it's really hard to get somebody out of that and get them strong and stable and moving along into moving better with less pain so um, I always like to kind of hit that the first day whether that's an acute person or a chronic person. One of the most valuable things that I've only recently started doing on an evaluation especially for low back pain I think it's the most valuable is I'll ask We'll like do the normal subjective stuff and then I'll ask, why do you think your back hurts? Why do you think you have this back pain? And that will like just show you exactly what that person's dealing with, what their conceptions are, things they've been told in the past by doctors, things they've read online, all these things that are contributing to this whole experience for them, which is which is very important to not separate from the physical, the mechanical, all this stuff is is why does this person think they have this? Because if you go on this like 95 minute tirade about abs and all this and position stuff, but they still think they've got a disc poking out the back, like they're still gonna be scared to try to touch their toes. So something as simple as it, it works with a lot of things, but you can learn a ton by just being like, why do you think your back hurts? Or why, is, why are you feeling this the way you are? It's, it can, it can uh, open a lot of doors conversationally. And then it tells you like, what things do I have to address in, in this person's understanding of what they have? Like, what do I know that I, can, that I can give to them that might help ease the anxiety level? Yeah, I, I think that's so huge, Sean, um, because patients do come in with um, a lot of preconceived notions and have been told a lot of different things from you know, friends, family members, um, as well as other healthcare providers. So anything that we can do from a patient education standpoint that tailors the message to um, kind of fit their individual frame, I think is just so crucial early on. Um, and I think that's a great place to transition. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we hear some crazy stuff from patients sometimes as to why 
they're experiencing uh, low back pain. Um, I think personally, the most common one that I've heard from patients is, well, I know I have low back pain because I have tight hamstrings. Um, I wanted to open it up to Tyler. When you hear that from a patient, what is your typical uh, explanation as to why that probably um, isn't the case and why there's kind of a lot more nuance to it than just that? So the main thing I talk about when someone says they have tight hamstrings is um, the difference between a muscle being tight and a muscle being, you know, short or have some tone in it that prevents movement. So feeling tight is a sensation. It's not a state of the muscle. Um, and just explaining that kind of sparks a conversation about, okay, well then why can't I touch my toes? And then you can talk about, you know, well, if your hamstrings aren't prevent or if your hamstrings don't perceive that there's um, stability in the pelvis, then they're going to stop you from moving down so that you don't fall on your face. That's the main um, function of the hamstrings is to not let you fall forward. So if your body or if your brain senses any sort any sort of instability there in the system, then your hamstrings are going to kick on, prevent you from touching your toes. Um, okay, great. So how do we fix that? So then, you know, we, we can break it down through the SFMA with, okay, can you lie on your, or can you sit and touch your toes there? No. Okay. Can you lie on your back and lift one leg at a time? Oh, you can lift your left leg and not your right leg. Okay. Let's break that down further. And then we have our other um, tests and measures too, to determine why somebody would sense that their hamstrings are tight. But 99.9% .9 of the time, and this is me saying that I've never seen somebody with truly shortened muscle tissue in the hamstrings, it's going to be a, some sort of neurological um, stop there, preventing somebody from, for example, lifting their leg up to 90 degrees or touching their toes. I think that was perfect. Uh, another one um, that I hear a lot as well is people hear this from other healthcare providers that they have low back pain because of weakness, uh, specifically like in the core or the glutes. So B, when, when a patient says that to you and, and patients are sure of it, how do you go about explaining that? Again, there's probably a little bit more nuance to it and it's not so simple. Yeah, I think it's a combination of kind of what everyone's been talking about. Like there's that sort of, you know, fear of thinking that they're not strong, which also plays into it. And then you also have the whole thing of like, well, I've been doing like all these exercises that I looked up online to strengthen my core. And it's like, you really have to have kind of like an educational session there where you're talking about like, you know, um, container control and like being able to kind of move the things the way you want to. It's not necessarily like you have to do it one way or one way it's more of like being stuck in a position and not being able to kind of have variety there. It's not like you're weak in a certain position. It's just overworked somewhere, not working somewhere else, maybe as much. Um, so I think it's a big part on us to kind of be that educational uh, guidance for them. And um, also like, like to what Sean was saying, just kind of like get rid of that fear of like something's wrong with me, like nothing's wrong with you. It's just, we got to teach you how to do some different things. So in addition to those common uh, phrases that we hear from patients, we also commonly hear, um, you know, they had some imaging, whether it's uh, x-ray, MRI, whatever it is, and the doctor let them know that they kind of found some abnormal findings, and the patient is convinced that their back pain is 110% related to that, and there's, you know, a, a significant structural issue even though functionally they move pretty well and, and they don't have a lot of pain. Um, Michelle, how do you go about uh, addressing that topic of pain not necessarily correlating to imaging findings? Again, I think this goes back to patient education. Um, if we did an MRI of everyone in the population, I bet you most of the population would have some sort of abnormality. You, most of us probably have some sort of small disc herniation and whether you are symptomatic or not symptomatic um, is truly where it comes down to things. Um, with regards to educating on um, when someone needs an MRI or an X-ray, 
I think everyone should start with physical therapy first. I think uh, sometimes a physician may jump too quickly to getting imaging. I think everyone should start with PT prior to getting imaging. And then if they're unsuccessful with physical therapy, with proper physical therapy, and then the imaging then shows um, some sort of abnormality there, then we go back and we have a conversation between the physical therapist, the patient, and the physician. I think a common thing is when I'm working with a lot of clients that are dealing with lower back pain as a symptom, they'll ask me like, should I get an MRI or should I get an imaging? And I tell them like, listen, if you want to do it for your own peace of mind, you can, but it's not going to change the way I treat you. If I have a piece of paper that says X, Y, and Z is going on in your back from a structural standpoint, my treatment method and my recovery plan for you probably isn't going to change because I'm not treating your MRI report. I'm treating you as a person, as a patient that comes in and presents a certain way, that moves a certain way, that has a certain lifestyle, that has these amount of stressors in their life. I'm treating an individual, not a piece of paper that's saying, oh, there's a three centimeter or three millimeter bulge at L4, L5. Like, to be honest, I don't really care about that. Um, because to Michelle's point, get MRI, everyone's lower back, we're probably all going to have a little something going on. If you have pain in an area, you get diagnostic imaging, they're going to find something. And they're going to blame it on something. But, you know, there's a quote that we we learned back in PT school that most orthopedic surgeons believe that structure governs function versus the way PTs can look at things is the opposite. It's almost that function is going to govern structure. So, you know, we know from an early age that if you're you're weight bearing, you're going to increase bone density. So what you do can implicate or implement how your 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 structure is is formed and how you can move so diagnostic imaging almost for me i mean maybe if we've been working with a client for a while and we're just not getting any uh any improvement which we normally would see after you know x amount of time then i'd say all right let's go back to the drawing board and maybe there's something else um you know god forbid it's not something you know cancerous or or whatever but that would probably be a time that I'd say, all right, go get some imaging and let's see what we're dealing with if we're just hitting brick walls after brick walls. But more often than not, it's, um, I, I really do- tell them almost, you know, I wouldn't get it if we don't think we need it. Yeah, for me, it's more of a method to rule out major issues that we wouldn't be able to detect without it. Um, if there's nothing that really jumps out on the MRI report, I mean, if if there's, you know, mild to moderate narrowing of the joint space, then we say, okay, I probably have that too. Um, Let's just, you know, do our assessment and treat what we see on the assessment that not necessarily what shows up on this MRI. Um, But like you said, if we're kind of hitting a brick wall or to me, if someone's pain is behaving in a different way than what we've seen, then it's okay, maybe we should go get an, uh, just an MRI or something to get a better look at what's going on in there just to make sure it's not something like a tumor growing on the spinal cord, for example, which we have run into in somebody whose pain was really, really severe and didn't change with any pos- positional changes. And that was a really good lesson of, okay, this stuff does happen. It's happened once in the past three or four years, but it does happen. And that's where an MRI can really be valuable versus, you know, oh, I have a little bit of back pain that behaves like normal back pain doesn't necessarily warrant something like an MRI or x-ray. There was a client that Tyler and I shared that kind of had something going on. Both uh, Tyler and I were working with her and we just weren't making any headway. I mean, in in interventions that normally we would have saw huge progress. Uh, So we told her like, go back at MRI. And it turns out she had a cyst growing right off of her spine. Um, that we wouldn't have been able to detect. She had the cyst, um, you know, basically they, 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 they popped the cyst and all her symptoms went away and she was fine. I don't know if we ever saw her again after that, but that was one of those cases where it was like, all right, maybe an MRI, you know, is worthwhile if, if we're just hitting our head against the wall. But, um, you know, more often than not, it's just going to freak the patient out if they get this list of things that are wrong with their spine that they didn't even know that was going on. That really isn't a big deal, but to them, they're reading this, you know, crazy medical jargon about, you know, what's happening and, and then they're going to get more freaked out and then they're going to be more timid to move. And then it can, uh, can almost be more negative than positive. 
So when I, when I have people that are going in that have kind of hit that point <clears throat> where they're going to get an MRI, I'll try to try to prep them a little bit, um, you know, and just say, look, you know, I don't think anyone sit, you know, anyone in on this call right now has ever seen someone get an MRI coming back that says they're perfect, right? I mean, even, even younger kids, you're going to see probably a little bit of some sort of degenerative quality. And I think sometimes preparing, you know, patient or client going in and saying, look, you're going to see degenerative disc disease. You're going to see arthritic developments. If you're like any other normal person, you're probably going to see some level of small herniation, small little bits of stenosis. There's going to be something in there. And I do think, you know, at times, you know, people, you know, to what Kev's point was, where they look at it and it's like, geez, you know, it looks like a bomb went off in my spine. It's like I got a case of the everythings. Um, and they certainly don't understand a lot of the verbiage or, you know, what the radiologist has interpreted as. And then there's usually a lot of, I think, lost um, information between the doc sometimes, you know, trying to under, you know, let, let a patient understand what this image you know, really means. And then that turns into a whole other problem of then trying to correlate what we see on the image to how a person's pain patterns are, or how they behave. Um, and for some people, I don't think it's anyone in this group, you know, where they'll, they'll tend to go into treating an image versus treating that person or treating how they're presenting. And I think that that kind of becomes an important thing um, to understand that, you know, the magnitude of what you see on the image doesn't always correlate to the magnitude of the pain or the dysfunction that they're actually having. Um, so I think that's, that's something kind of important to get across someone. So it kind of talks them off the ledge a little bit so they don't, you know, freak out, you know, too, too much. And then, you know, just like you guys were talking about, like with the cysts and um, other things that you find on the spine sometimes that are kind of intractable or really hard to really identify from a physical exam. I mean, other than that, I mean, the only other time, you know, I think where I'm kind of pushing people, you know, towards MRI a little bit is if they come in and they have some sort of true myotoma weakness, you know, some sort of, you know, random, you know, cauda equina stuff. I had a guy a couple months ago who, you know, was talking about how he was having some bladder issues all of a sudden. So he had, you know, a very small degree of cauda equina. They ended up not treating it surgically, but it got it underway so that they were able to get things taken care of. So there wasn't any real long, you know, long lasting damage and they're able to fix that situation. So, you know, I think, you know, unless there's some really, really strong red flags or someone's really hitting roadblocks, then you got to kind of maybe help facilitate them getting an image when you're kind of, you know, that the conservative stuff to this point's kind of run its point and they might need something a little bit bigger, um, you know, to help get them through that next point. As a patient, I would say it's not, it's not your job to figure out any of this. Your job would be to, to get to someone you trust, whether that is somebody in the primary care setting or a rehab professional. And then it's going to be up to them. Like all the stuff we're talking about is, is their role that those are their tasks that they have to complete to make sure you're in the best hands. Um, it's going to be tempting to want imaging, but usually it's not going to change what we do at all. <clears throat> And it might lead to further anxieties of seeing things that are, you know, that have been there for 15 years before you had any pain. And that's one of the things that I say the most, um, just a succinct way of getting it across when I'm talking to a patient is generally the, a person we're seeing with back pain has days where it's better, days where it's worse, times where it's really, really bad, times where they don't really notice it. And I'll say, all right, you know, like those things we saw in the imaging, like this decreased disc height maybe a little bit of bulging, maybe some fibrosis on the disc, those sort of things. Those are there in the times when you feel good, and those are there in the times that you feel bad. So if those are there 24-7, how the heck could they be causing the symptoms all the time? If, that's, if those were causing the symptoms, you would be in pain 24-7. It wouldn't change. These exercises wouldn't really make an effect. But we know that there's something more going on than just this thing they saw on a picture. Because if, if that was the only thing, then you would have constant symptoms, but you don't. So there must be something at least more going on than, than what we see here. Yeah, I, th I think that was perfect. Um, I think just highlighting that patients feel really good when they still have those structural abnormalities that they would find on imaging really goes a long way. Um, because although it may seem almost uh, simple for like us to consider, you know, um, for patients, that, that's like a big jump conceptually to wrap your head around, you know. Um, I, I guess in, in me educating my parents personally, you know, they're getting older, they have their aches and pains. They are going through all this stuff right now where it's like, I have all these a million things wrong with me, but then I'll have these days where, you know, I feel completely fine. And it's like, well, 
you probably are not that banged up in general. So I, I think anything we can do to just um, instill some confidence and, and cultivate some self-optimism and patience really goes a long way um, in their overall rehab and treatment trajectory. Um, so I think here would probably good be, be a good place to actually segue into uh, the rehab process itself. Um, I think we're really lucky because we have the training side of things. So our overall um, rehab process can really go a long way from stuff on the table, you know, really low intensity, low threshold stuff, all the way back to uh, legitimate training. Um, and I think it would be really beneficial for people to kind of hear how we go about that process and work them back to uh, being super active and, and training and doing the things that they want to do. From uh, the short-term perspective, what does the first couple visits look like uh, for a patient who's normally pretty active, uh, but they're just a little bit more jacked up? Uh, they're probably a little fearful, um, but the ultimate goal is to get back into training and being super active. Um, B, what does that look like for you? I think it depends a lot on like what Kev was saying, if they're very acute or if they're chronic. It, but obviously the first few visits, you're kind of testing, retesting, seeing where the patient's at, if they can hold on to any progress you make during the first visit. Um, uh, you obviously want to regain their mobility, like their ability to kind of move. Um, so if you have someone who's like terrified to touch their toes, maybe you're really not doing a lot of activity first. Maybe it's more hands-on, just trying to kind of desensitize the system. Um, whereas if it's someone who's like, I want to start getting to move, maybe you're not doing as much table stuff. Um, and you're kind of get, having them do active stuff to kind of regain their ability to uh, move and get around. Um, so I think it kind of varies depending on who presents. Um, I still think there's a lot of patient education in there and um, kind of teaching them to not be afraid to move um, is one of the big things, getting them to be kind of aware of where they're feeling things and like where in their body they are right now is like usually some of the first things I start with. Um, I think that either way, sometimes a little bit of hands-on therapy, not because men like, the actual stretching or anything is going to do much, but just having that one-on-one -on -one touch with someone who's terrified can help kind of desensitize them a little bit. Um, so that's usually where I start, but I obviously always like getting people moving by the end of their session because any movement is going to help. Yeah, I think uh, recently, I know from my perspective as the most recent graduate, uh, manual therapy and passive modalities um, it's kind of like really cool to dump on them and say that they're not effective in treatment and they really have no place in PT. But I think uh, acutely they can be super effective. Not that we're physically changing what's going on structurally, but just desensitizing, um, you know, local areas of pain uh, with manual therapy, with passive modalities to then open up the door for a reduced apprehension to movement, I think goes a long way. Um, as long as we're not doing that their entire treatment plan, um, I, I think we can be super creative in how we desensitize people and, and really get them to feel more comfortable uh, and confident in moving again. I, I think that's huge acutely, and I think we all do a really good job of that. Um, so transitioning from the, we'll say, post-acute phase, someone, you know, their symptoms have gone down, they're, they're a little bit more confident, they're starting to move a little bit more. Uh, let's say, you know, just for the sake of this, they're normally doing group fitness classes or, or CrossFit or weightlifting or something like that. Michelle, how do you kind of start to bridge the gap in, in a treatment standpoint to get them back to uh, their activities? Okay, to answer your uh, question, Cam, I think with regards to getting back to strength and conditioning, you have to start from the ground up, right? We need to make sure that they can get into a position on the ground and then work back up through all of our positions again. So the way that we do that is supine, and then we work back up through um, a half kneel, tall kneel to a full stand, and then actually get to jumping and plyometrics, and then eventually to sprinting. So it's kind of like you have to pass your checkpoints before you can get back to full Olympic lifts, sprinting, um, and higher level mechanics. Um, 
So the nice part about Train Boston is we have the gym there and we have trainers to basically take us back through those progressions. And the nice part about Train Boston classes is a lot of our classes have a physical therapist on with one of our trainers. So the PT is kind of assessing while a group session may be going on and they may pull somebody back and regress a movement. Um, say they get to kettlebell deadlifts and the movement in class is a kettlebell swing and they're just not ready for that. Maybe they're regressing the movement back to a, um, you know, a kettlebell deadlift with a yoga block or some sort of regression instead of really pushing to that next level. So it's nice how we have a seamless transition back into classes with um, our system that we have at Train. Yeah, I, I think we're pretty lucky in that regard. Um, kind of continuing down this, uh, this rabbit hole, um, I know a lot of us love to use constraints in treatment and in rehab. Um, to basically transition someone from, uh, you know, the lower threshold, lower intensity activities to, um, you know, basically the activities that they were doing before they got hurt. Uh, Ty, I'd love to hear your perspective on how we use and, and implement uh, constraints during treatment um, to put patients in the best position to be successful uh, with specific exercises and tasks. In a chronic issue like chronic low back pain, um, it's super important, in my opinion, to get somebody to experience previously painful or threatening movements without pain, because that's the only way that your body is going to adapt to being able to do these new movements, such as, you know, picking up a laundry basket or um, turning to give their kids something in the car that it used to hurt, but they're now able to do it without pain. And the way that we do that is through constraints. So when you say constraint, for example, um, if someone has pain with the lunge, then you can put their back foot on a wall or elevate their front foot. And when you do that, it just makes it a little easier for somebody to use their hip instead of their knee or their back. And at, at its most basic form, that <clears throat> that's what we're talking about when we refer to a constraint. So for low back pain, um, a really my end goal for most people, and when I say most people, I say somebody who's not looking back to doing something like back squatting or Olympic lifting or something really high level. For most people that we see, our end goal is just to get them to pick up something heavy off the floor without their back hurting. And to me, that's a deadlift. So a constraint on a deadlift would be to um, get rid of that portion where they're fighting against gravity and force the person to use their hips to move forward and backward. And we do that by doing an exercise like a rope pull through. And what that does is it makes a force pull them backward rather than down <clears throat> so that they understand how to use their hips to propel themselves forward rather than up. And it's a lot easier for the brain to understand that movement versus something like a deadlift. And then you can progress it to a deadlift because the person already understands how to do that movement with the hips versus the spine. And to me, for an issue like back pain, that's going to be one of the most important things. And then you can add constraints to things like a um, single leg RDL or single leg hinge, where you're putting a back foot on a wall or using a slider. You're just making it a little easier for the person to be successful at that specific movement. Um, and so that they can do it most importantly, pain free. Yeah, I, th I think that was very well put. Um, I know just in observing all of you guys treat, um, we all kind of share the common goal of, uh, in some capacity, trying to restore just foundational movement patterns. So in regards to, you know, lower back pain, um, typically we're going to want to see people uh, hinge well without discomfort, squat well without discomfort, uh, and perform some lunge position without discomfort. Um, I'm curious as to how you guys explain that to uh, the non-active population. Um, you know, we, we do have a decent uh, percentage of the older crowd come in here who has no experience weightlifting um, and is frankly a little intimidated by it. So how do you guys kind of layer those same treatment principles uh, in a way that is appropriate for that different population? Dave, what do you got for me? I think, uh, you know, 
part of, you know, if, if you're talking about someone that doesn't really have any background at all with any sort of active activity, exercise, anything like that, and you're trying to cross the bridge as to why is teaching somebody how to squat or bend over, you know, or deadlift or lunge or any of those, those primary movements, why are they important to somebody you know, that's suffering with back pain? So um, I think one, you know, helping to establish getting them over the fear and avoidance of movement, right, is a, is a pretty, pretty big concept for starters. But then I think trying to get them to understand that these exercises that maybe they've never done, there's a lot of functional overturn for them. So, you know, learning like, you know, like a squat, you know, take the mechanics of a squat and maybe make it a little more approachable for them for every time they're getting out of a low chair, you know, or using the bathroom, you know, the, you know, things like squats like that, they, they're, they're looking at it from the context of strictly just an exercise or maybe, you know, these people that they see, you know, in the gym that are, you know, younger and super fit, you know, lifting heavy weights, well, we might be talking about it much more in the context of, you know, just pure functional movement to help them, you know, navigate their day better. Uh, whether that's, you know, picking up, you know, their grandchild off the ground or getting out of a car, it becomes really important for them to kind of learn those foundational movements and how to really kind of organize how they're using their hips and their pelvis relative to their spine um, to get them to, you know, achieve those things, you know, pretty much pain-free and not be fearful of that, of that movement. So, I think a lot of it in the beginning is just kind of transitioning for them to understand why it's important and then kind of you know what i think a lot of people already touched on you're going you know from smaller components of that movement from you know a non-weight bearing partial weight bearing environment up until weight bearing and picking something up um, and explain to them why you know certain parts of these small movements become really critical to you know master so that they can get to these bigger bigger patterns of movement to do it successfully and without pain so um, I think that's kind of the transition that I kind of try to try to use, you know, with the people that are in that population that, you know, don't typically, you know, work out or um, are just really deconditioned. Yeah, I think when you uh, layer it in a way that's digestible to the patient, um, and then you kind of pick their brain as to what types of movements or activities they do throughout the day, I, I think a lot of them are pretty shocked and surprised at um, how strong they are functionally. Um, and how much of that stuff they already do. So I, I think it's really just in how we present that information uh, and make it useful and applicable to the patient um, because really we want to address similar things in treatment. It's just how we're trying to um, have them appreciate kind of what we're doing, you know, because their they're, they're buy into the treatment plan is kind of one of the most important factors in, in terms of determining overall success. So I think you crushed that, Dave. Um, let's talk about, say we're getting back to the athletic population. Uh, I know I've heard a lot of other healthcare providers when someone has an acute bout of low back pain, um, they've told their patients to stop doing activity X or, or stop doing activity Y or Z, whatever it is. Um, there's a lot of removal of, uh, painful stimuli or exercises or whatever it is. I think we do a really good job here of not removing things and kind of meeting people halfway in the middle, especially um, when it's activities that patients are super passionate about. Um, so Kev, I, I would love to hear your thoughts because I'm sure you have a ton of experience with this. What is that kind of middle ground there between uh, determining you know, if, if something is, is too difficult for someone or could potentially cause more harm, um, on the flip side of, you know, this is something that they gradually kind of need to re-expose themselves to uh, in terms of getting back to what they want to do. I mean, so every population is going to be a little bit different. So if you want to kind of tackle the higher level athlete, um, you know, when they get like small bouts of lower back pain, it's actually a really great opportunity for us to scale them back and to identify the little things that they're not doing well, because typically when they go through the system, they're getting looked at more globally as to what they can do athletically. And because they're so athletic, they can compensate better than anyone else on the planet. And those small, you know, compensatory movements are often getting missed and they're going through treatment and stuff to see you know, how explosive they can be and how dynamic and when really they might need something that's a lot simpler that is just getting overlooked and passed by. So with with athletes, it's a really good opportunity for us as, as healthcare practitioners to kind of peel back the layers and try to have them do something that we know they're not going to be able to do well, but they'll think they can do it well and it's super easy. So it could be, you know, 
a simple, you know, straight leg raise that we, we know that they're going to get screwed up on or, you know, they might be able to touch their toes or palm the floor and standing, but if then you get them in a long sit position and have them try to touch their toes, they might not be able to do it. And then you're like, all right, all your compensation is coming from your spine or whatever. So with higher level athletes, it's fun. You can really peel back the layers and kind of hit the points that I think a lot of people miss on them. Um, and then in terms of some of the other population, if you have, you know, a client that's, you know, north of 80 years old, you're not going to expect them to touch their toes. I mean, if they can, fantastic, but that's not going to be the general uh, population of that, that age group. So with them, it's, it's scaling back to expectations into what they can do, where it's like, all right, if you're sitting, how far down from a seated position, if you're sitting on a chair or a bench, how far down can you get to, you know, put on your sneakers or tie your shoes? And then you're just looking for small improvements in that sitting posture with that forward bend multi-segmental flexion pattern. So you're just catering it to different populations and, and uh, being able to, to just make small improvements where you can without trying to skip anything or overlook anything. Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I like the direction that you went with that. Um, I guess in regards to treating high level athletes, um, let's say they you know, have a, a bout of acute low back pain um, how do you guys go about navigating, um, you know, them rehabbing and taking time without losing overall fitness and, and, you know, uh, capacity to exercise and, and perform their sport? What's that middle ground for you, Sean? To be honest, it's not really athlete dependent on, in that case, in terms of trying to keep some sort of capacity. It's, it's try to hit all of the benchmarks of maybe what their sport is but really what general fitness is at that point it's just being being a being a trainer but understanding limitations they might have if they're still symptomatic so still making sure you're hitting whatever benchmarks they are they you know in a they're in a sport where they've got to do higher level things use something like an assault bike use something that's going to have them have higher output lower working times if they're more of a long distance type athlete or continuous motion then using some of the other tools we have we're, we're really lucky with the equipment that we have there's I haven't run into something where um, we've been limited by materials to be able to keep an athlete in shape or moving um, there's a lot of different a lot of different tricks to do that and, and I would say that back pain probably isn't too too much of a limiter maybe like something lower extremity would be a little bit more where I'm scratching my head to try to figure out something cardio based for them to do um, but back pain you can you can work around a decent amount but it comes back to what you've done before that like what foundations have you laid so that it, when you're doing some sort of strengthening getting this person making sure they're not losing anything what foundations have you laid? Do they know how to hinge well? Do they know how to get into a split squat well and out of it? Can they lunge? Can they do these different multi-directional things? With back, sometimes like a transverse frontal plane, meaning moving to the side and twisting and rotation is going to be a little bit more um, common of a position to have uh, a back like erector flare up because those can be very powerful muscles in athletes and they want to work a lot of the time. So just breaking things down early and then calling back on those when you're in that higher level stage, like when you're doing a, a shuffle to med ball throw, you have to make sure that they've done, like Kevin talked about, they've done like the bare bones components of it early. Because analogy I'll use sometimes is this is not correct at all anatomically of what's going on, but something that tends to stick is like uh, if I poke my arm right now, no problem, no pain. If something happened and I had a bruise here and I poked it, it wouldn't feel too good. So them doing med ball tosses with a whole ton of back as they did before, that wasn't an issue. But now they've got some sort of flare up. So if they go back to their old pattern of how they compensated through movement patterns and they now do a med ball toss on something that's still a little bit fresh, it's probably not going to feel too good. It might lead to some sort of flare up. So we need to get them into positions where they're not using their same patterns if it is something that let led to the position that they're in i'm going to jump in real quick too one more time um i think for athletes that are in sport and um they're coming in with some lower back pain but they know that they have to go to practice they're not going to shut it down um and they need to perform at whatever level they're 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 playing at i think the way that we manage that is we just tell them listen do the stuff i give you first let me set you up for more success at least 
if I know you're going to go thrash your back in practice of whatever sport you're doing, take, you know, 10, 15 minutes, go over the stuff that we're going over at least first, do my stuff first and then go off. Cause at least that's going to set them on a path to be more successful than where they were at. If you can't completely shut an athlete down and you know, they have to do all the, the, the rigors of whatever practice or, um, you know, game ready stuff that they have to do. I think also, uh, it's a good opportunity to go back over breathing because a lot of movements, a lot of athletes, when they're in practice, they're not thinking about their breathing and it's a good time to retract back and focus on maybe a med ball wall slam and focus on that explosive control with a, a powerful exhale. Um, and if they can reprogram themselves with their breathing, hopefully that carries over to the field. Um, and we know breathing is a huge component to back pain because of where that diaphragm sits. That's a great transition. Um, let's talk a little bit about breathing. So obviously all of us have been a little bit, uh, influenced by Postural Restoration Institute and, and their concepts and, um, how they do things. Um, a lot of our initial sessions with patients who have low back pain, uh, are going to incorporate some type of low threshold breathing exercise. Um, and we, you know, get the question a lot of, well, how the heck does, breathing or blowing up this balloon help my back feel better. Um, Bianca, how do you go about answering that question and then basically um, appreciating the importance of breathing throughout the entire uh, rehab process uh, when you're explaining that to patients? It also kind of depends on who you're dealing with. Like if I'm dealing with a kid, I may not be explaining as well as I would with an adult. Um, if I'm with a kid, I might, you know, say obviously something like, oh, well, I really want you to focus on exhaling because you're going to feel a lot of abs just so they kind of understand where I'm, what I'm looking for. Whereas if I'm talking with someone who wants to know really what they're doing, um, I'm talking more about like, yeah, I want you to kind of learn how to control different pressures in your system and um, be able to use that when you're going through different movements to have better um, variety with what you're doing. Um, obviously, like Michelle said, diaphragm is really important and making sure that you're like, obviously all of us are not huge diaphragmatic breathing people where we teach people to breathe through their stomach because that's not where you're supposed to breathe. Um, we're teaching them to use kind of everything at once and manage the pressure system, um, have places where you can expand and compress and have that kind of throughout the whole um, chest. Um, so I think that that's very important to kind of teach a lot of our, probably more of our older clients um, and adults, whereas a kid, I'm kind of just trying to make them get that sensory motor like, oh, do you feel this here? Okay, that's where I want you to, that's what I want you to feel. That's where you should feel it type thing. Tyler, I'd love to hear your insights into how we incorporate breathing um, into the entire rehab process, given that you've kind of spearheaded the PRI movement here, I think. There's a common misconception that um, this approach, you know, PRI is very breathing based. Like all you're doing is lying your, on your back and blowing up balloons. But what it really comes down to is what's happening in your brain. So if you're in a ton of back extension, in other words, if your spine is locked out because your ribs are all the way up here and you, we want to say, okay, we got to get your ribs back down so that your back can relax. And the only way to do that is by exhaling. So if we get someone to exhale and everything kind of relaxes, then that's a win for us. So what people think is that, oh, if I just lie on my back and do these breathing exercises, my back will feel better. It's like, well, maybe it will, but we have to get you to breathe better to accomplish our goals of treatment, which is to do things like pick something up off the floor, squat to a chair, whatever it is. Um, sometimes a prerequisite to that is just the ability to exhale fully and then put air into places of your rib cage that there was an air before. So if we break it down um, into a movement-based approach, which we all do, it's so much more than just, we have to get you to breathe better. It's like doing these exercises and incorporating breathing into them really helps us accomplish that goal, which if we just let you hold your breath while you try to pick this thing up off the floor, it probably wouldn't feel very good. And you'd probably feel like you're going to pass out because you're holding your breath. But it's super common, right? We have so many people who come in and say, 
you know, you tell them, okay, breathe. And then they say, Oh, I always forget to, I don't know why. It's like, well, their body is using their diaphragm to hold themselves upright. So what we have to teach them to do is to get their diaphragm to relax and be a breathing muscle again, so that it's not the main muscle holding them up. We have other muscles like glutes, hamstrings, and abs, which we talk about all the time that are made to hold ourselves up. So just restoring the ability of that diaphragm to move up and down as we breathe can sometimes decrease someone's back pain and be the treatment. And other times it's just a means to an end. I would uh, just kind of tag off of what Tyler was saying, going back to it being about uh, regulating the neurosystem. Um, basically, when you're exhaling, like you're going into parasympathetic system, right? So inhalation is sympathetic and exhalation is parasympathetic. So the main goal with what Tyler was saying is really getting someone to kind of just relax the system for a minute, which with low back pain is super important because they're already fearful of movement. They're terrified that a disc is going to bulge out whenever they bend backwards. So just teaching them to kind of rest and digest is kind of a big part of that. Going into the autonomic nervous system, kind of like fight or flight or rest and digest is like a whole rabbit hole we could spend a ton of time talking about. But um, a simple test somebody can do at home is you breathe out a comfortable amount and you see how long you can hold it. What we're looking for is your ability to hold it for 10 to 15 seconds. And what we find is that someone with low back pain can normally hold it for less than three. There's a guy in Russia who wants you to hold it for 40. So we know that it's doable and it's actually a treatment for COPD. He uses it for respiratory issues, which is very relevant right now in this day and age. But that's a simple test you can do at home is just breathe out a comfortable amount until you feel like you can't breathe out anymore and then just see how long you can stay there. Um, I think I got eight or nine seconds, but it was the longest eight or nine seconds of my life when I tried it. So um, it's a really simple test just to see, hey, where am I at today? Because it's going to change day to day too. One uh, thing I also wanted to hit on, um, I guess, you know, we take someone through rehab, they're feeling really good. We get the question a lot of, okay, I feel good. Do I have to do my exercises forever? What, like, what do I do now? You know, uh, assuming they're not working out at our gym, how do you guys handle that discharge period um, to set them up for future success so they have the tools to kind of self-regulate and, and basically stay relatively pain-free in the future? Sean, what do you got? Um, for me, it comes back to to education very early. There's a lot of good research on, regardless of the body part, on pain education and not in the sense of here's a packet, this is what's happening. It's like very like listening to what they have to say, choosing how you want to intervene on that, trying to change their, um, or trying to address what they've been told, the things that they have in their head about why they're having pain, the things that contribute to their pain, what their limitations are going to be. Like from day one, that's, that's, I'm trying to have that shape, you know, my education, my exercises I'm doing with them. You know, if they have pain when they get out of a chair, I'm starting in a 90, 90. And then I'm saying, Hey, imagine if we rotated this 90 degrees, we're teaching your body how to be in this, you know, knee bent, hip bent position and turn some muscles on. So next we're gonna do it standing and it'll look like a squat and we're working towards those goals. So <clears throat> what I was getting back to is there's good research on, on pain education, especially as it relates to the low back, that it's not gonna have a huge impact on the person's acuity. Like if I tell someone like, hey, you know what? Like it's not really, it's probably not your disc that's the main contributor to this. It's probably these other factors, these other things going on. Um, it's not really going to change that course, but they did like a 10 year study and the people who had um, back pain flare ups again, it was, uh, this is, that will, those weren't words. Cut. <laughs> um, so for the people who received some sort of pain education and had their conceptions challenged, um, those people were significantly less likely to have a flare-up of back pain in the future. So the educational part isn't like, hey, I'm going to tell you that what you think is like, you know, might not be correct and you're going to feel better because of it. But if we can get these people to start integrating these things that 
dang, you know, I felt my back pull the other day. Maybe it's because it's just like my nervous system trying to protect me and it sensed that something was going on. And I have these tools that I've regulated with it. I've regulated it with before. Maybe I can try some of that stuff again. That's going to be incredibly powerful because if someone comes in, they think it's their disc, you give them a few exercises, they feel better and they leave. The next time they twinge, they're going to be like, I thought I was better. Now my disc is worse. So nothing has really changed except for the acuity of the symptoms. So if you can really attack from day one, and attack's too violent of a word, but if you can address from day one, like how this person's perceiving what's happening to them and why they're in your office, it's going to have a huge impact on what happens down the line. And, and when people leave, to actually answer your question, when people leave, I'm giving them a few things that they can do. Or what I'll really do is like, here are your three. If you feel something come on, do these. Let me know what happens. Send me an email if you want and we can talk about it. But just giving people something that they can have in their pocket to help manage it. And that's always the framework is here are some things that you can help to help manage this yourself. And this should be powerful enough for, for the symptoms that you've been getting. Um, people will be a lot more confident than saying you have to do these all the time because that's just promoting fragility. It's if you do, don't do this, then your body's going to do this. That's, I don't usually go that route. I say, Hey, do a few of these, you know, a couple times a week, but generally we're encouraging people to continue on with fitness. So generally it's, Hey, you should think about doing some strength training, build some resiliency, build some tissue stress, build some, you know, ability to tolerate all these different things you do in your life. Um, whether it's, you know, with us or not, it's something independent. We want people to continue to get stronger because the stronger they get, the less little tweaks impact them. If my tolerance to lifting something off the floor is 25 pounds, if I lift something 22 pounds, I'm right there, I'm close. If my tolerance is 200 pounds. When I lift that 200 pound thing, now I'm at 10% of my tolerance instead of 98% of my tolerance. So building that bigger window of adaptation and ability to, to tolerate stress is, is important. So I'm usually encouraging some sort of activity and fitness, but it's, it's usually not a do these or you'll get hurt again sort of thing. To comment on the other side of that, what we do find is that uh, some people are told that their pain is all in their head. And to me, that's a really, really bold and kind of dangerous statement to make to somebody. Um, you know, if I'm going to a physical therapist to get physical therapy, and then I'm told that I have to go to a psychiatrist because my pain is um, in my head and there's no reason for it other than this kind of psychological side to it. To me, that's as a, if I were a patient and I heard that I'd be kind of taken aback, I wouldn't know what to think. I'd be like, what's wrong with me? Like I, I was told by this healthcare provider that um, I'm making up my pain. And we found that there are people out there who have been told this thing. So from a movement perspective, there's like every single time we see someone, we find something that we can work on. I mean, I can't even imagine somebody who moves perfectly, who's super strong and who needs no other intervention besides counseling or, you know, SSRIs or some kind of drug, um, which some of my clients have been told that in the past. So this mix of movement training and education on how pain kind of works can be super valuable to somebody without going too far to each direction, I think is the most important part. Yeah, no, it's appreciation for it. It's absolutely reckless to say, hey, this is in your head. The 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 goal of it is to understand that, <clears throat> I mean, the model is like a biopsychosocial model. So there's these three tiers of things that can contribute to pain. And just saying one of them is the thing is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and it's not giving any sort of appreciation. And I think that's why doing education in some sort of actual calculated way is important so it doesn't come off as because I could very well be trying to express hey like there's there's some other factors that are that are contributing to this you know it's not only because your facet joint is jammed and if somebody comes into my office and they're very anxious about coming in and they hear that they could walk out and say this guy just told me it's all in my head so it's very important to like be like no the pain the pain is real like that is absolutely real there's no question there's just these there are these buckets of things that can contribute to it. Not one of them is the answer. And on, on, any, on any side of it, it's not only physical. So you should never leave an office and be like, 
yeah, this guy told me it's, it's because I jam on this all the time. And you should never leave an office and say like, this person told me that it's, I'm imagining it. Those are, it's, yeah. One of the big things I tell all my patients is movement is medicine and any sort of movement can be really good movement. Um, a lot when I see someone with back pain, I usually give them just reciprocal motion. And that reciprocal motion just means going for a walk and going for a walk without, you know, bringing a dog along or something that's not allowing for true reciprocal motion. This powerful movement of opposite arm and opposite leg action can be really therapeutic for the low back. Yeah, and there's a lot of going back to what Ty and B were talking about on the neuro side of things and how PRI is attacking neuro. That's that's similar. And the, the more uh, cross median motion there is or alternating one side or the other, the more that's involved and the decreased threat response there's going to be with that. So something that's crossing a midline or two things that are moving at the same time are going to be really, really powerful for that. And I think that was all like really, really well said. I just wanted to go back to um, part of Cam's, you know, question with, you know, how do you leave it with people? You know, so I think you know, just like what you guys said, you know, kind of breaking down some barriers, empowering them to move, you know, teaching them to move, you know, well and giving them a little bit of a, of a toolkit of things that they can do as a management and maintenance set to some degree um, can be important so that they know how to either address it when they have a little bit of a flare up or just establishing a program that they can do that's really approachable a couple times a week to every day of the week, um, depending on what they can fit in. But just keeping a lot of those, those patterns of motion and a lot of those muscles going that you guys have all been uh, working on with, with your clients and, and your, uh, your patients. Um, going back to the, to the quick athlete stuff, you know, like Kev, Kev hit on that point earlier where it was, um, you, you know, work on our stuff, you know, first to give them the ability to then succeed better. But uh, looks like we're running out of time here, so I'll let Cam take it. Yeah, so I, I guess just to wrap up that last question, um, I think it just comes down to setting expectations. I think it's unrealistic for any of us to tell our patients when you leave our office, you're never going to have pain again. That's just ridiculous. Um, if we give them the tools to understand that, you know, pain is sometimes a part of doing a lot of activities. Um, and then here are some easy ways to manage your discomfort um, so that when they do have little flare-ups, it's not the end of the world. I, I think that's huge. Um, but again, that just goes back to good patient education uh, throughout the entire rehab process. Um, so I think from here, we want to wrap things up. Um, I guess to summarize, low back pain, it, it's obviously a pretty broad phrase, um, but we would encourage anyone watching this or experiencing low back pain to seek out a, a medical professional, uh, physical therapist who they trust and, and who has experience um, bringing them through the entire trajectory of acute management all the way to getting them back to the things that they want to do. Um, and hopefully you can kind of set yourself up for success that way. So if you guys don't have any uh, parting thoughts, I think we'll wrap it up here.